couldn't join us tonight. So you'll see a little pop up. It just says this meeting's being recorded. Hit got it. I am actually the only one that's going to be recorded. Um, you can see there's like this little green, uh, green, yellow like bar around my screen. So so don't be shy. You will not be on camera. Um, I will be the only one recorded. So um, with that, let me just hit got it on all my screens. Um, let's get started. So we're going to actually start off with the Avgo Lemino soup recipe. So if you want to flip to that one in your packet. Um, we are just going to do one step, which is combining our rice and our chicken broth. So I've got lemon soup, especially for a lot of my local Chicagoans. You might be familiar with this uh, from Greek restaurants. It's basically a Greek lemon and rice chicken soup. So we're making a version that only has five ingredients. It's delicious, cozy, very creamy, uh, but no dairy. We're actually going to get that creaminess from eggs. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and get my chicken broth and my rice. So do we have a question? Okay. So we need eight cups of chicken broth. So if you bought stock, um, you know, in a box like this, it's going to be two boxes and then you need three quarters of a cup of uh, white rice. So whole grain, like a brown rice or black rice or something you could could use, but I'm not going to recommend it because we actually want the rice to overcook and soften. That starchiness is also going to be what thickens our soup and you just don't get that with whole grains. Um, so white rice is going to be classic for this. I'll show you what I'm working with. I'm just going to get it close up to the camera here. This is like a short grain rice. If you had like a risotto style rice, like a um, or boreal rice or something, that would be great too. And if all you have is long grain rice in my house, I always have basmati rice and usually nothing else, which is like with a really long rice, I've done that too. So really any kind of white rice works. The one thing I will want you to do though, is to put it in a fine mesh strainer and we just want to rinse it just for, you know, a couple seconds, get any of that extra starch or any, you know, any sort of powder, anything that's on there before it goes into our soup pot. So why don't you take a minute and uh, just rinse this. I'm gonna head over to the sink and do that as well. Um, and like room temperature water is great. We just want that water to run clear. Just don't want any of that excess stuff in our soup. Go ahead and take a minute for that. And then tonight I'll be using just two really big soup pots. So this is kind of like a stock pot. Um, if you have a, an enamel cast iron or something like that, that would be great too. So I am just going to take the lid off and we're just going to add those two ingredients, turn on the heat and let it start simmering. So I'm going to add my first four cups of chicken broth. And you could do a different type of broth as well, like a vegetable broth, but you know, some of the ingredients you need to really be able to call this an Avgo Lemino soup is, is chicken broth, the lemon. You, you can't substitute too much and call it the same thing. So chicken broth is really what's gonna give us that classic flavor. So that's eight cups, but if you did have like bouillon um, or like a better than bouillon, that would work too. And you could make your own stock that way. And then I have my rice that was just rinsed and I'm just gonna add it right in there. And this recipe, I think sometimes people are intimidated by it because they're like eggs and it's creamy and what do I do? And, you know, rice, it just, it seems like a lot of elements, but this is actually gonna be easier than cooking a pot of rice because we actually kind of want to overcook the rice. <laughs> um, it kind of just makes it even creamier and just cozier. So you don't even have to worry about like getting it to the right point. We're just gonna let it simmer away. So go ahead and turn your heat on, you know, high or medium high. Um, I like to get it up to high. I bring it up to the boil and then you can just kind of turn it down and let it simmer. And then I'm going to put a lid on the pot. So this is something, a, a question I get all the time in my cooking classes is, you know, okay, it, it's cooking. Do I put the lid on? Do I not put the lid on? So for this recipe, I'm going to put the lid on, but I would actually love to share with you why. So then you can answer that question when it comes up in your cooking, if your recipe does not specify that. So what does putting the lid on do? Um, and if you want to chime in um, or say in the chat, you can let me know, but what, what's the benefit of putting the lid on the pot? I'll see if anyone has any ideas.
Okay. And sorry, I know I'm asking you guys to cook and then answer my questions and type. So I know it's a lot. <laughs> um, yes, steam. Okay, I was wondering what that was. Yes, steam keeps the hate in. Steam lets the soup boil. Yes, you guys are, are geniuses. So this keeps that steam from escaping. So it's going to help this pot come to a boil more quickly. The heat is not escaping. The steam is not escaping. So you're not getting that um, liquid evaporation as well. So that's why we want to use it in this case. Cases where we would want to remove that lid are cases where we do want to evaporate some extra liquid off there. Um, like say, you know, our soup ends up really watery and we were like, oh, we were going for something thicker. Just let it simmer with that lid off. So it's not that one is correct and one is incorrect. It's just what's happening and, and how you want to harness that. So go ahead and get that lid on high or that lid on, turn it on high. And then if you have not yet, please turn on the ventilation in your kitchen. Actually, ideally, you know, here at the World of Whirlpool, um, you know, I, I'm a cooking expert, but I've actually become an uh, appliance and a kitchen expert um, through working here. It's actually best to turn on your ventilation or your hood um, actually before you start cooking because it helps get that um, flow of the air going. And then you want to leave it on about 10 minutes or so afterwards too, just to clear out, you know, if you have any oil you know, the steam, uh, you know, even the gas, like all of that stuff, you really don't want to be breathing in. You don't want it on your cabinets, things like that. So go ahead and turn on that ventilation. Even if you're going to turn it on low, you know, just go ahead and turn it on. So I'm going to just shuffle this around. I'm going to put this on my biggest burner just to save us a little bit of time. And I'll have this other one for the rest of our soup, their soup. Um, so I'm going to get this going here. And feel free to do that as well. Always pick your biggest burner when you're making something like a soup or you want to boil something. I feel like people often just use that the same burner over and over again, whatever corner they're comfortable with. Uh, but your biggest one is actually meant for your biggest cookware and usually has the highest um, heat. So go ahead and use that whenever you're, you're boiling or making soup and you can always shuffle your pots around a little bit too. So that is all we have to do for that um, soup. So next, we're actually going to switch to the squash and bison chili. So why don't we all get out all of the ingredients that we need for this? So only five, um, but we'll need our bison. I'll actually get them out to show you. I have them just right over here. And I'll clean up a little bit of excess stuff here. I'm kind of a messy cook. Um, I don't know who else is but I tend to just leave things out. So try to be a good example. Take a minute, clean up some dishes if you want um, or your boxes. I'm just gonna set a few things to the side. But definitely these five ingredient recipes, I, I love coming up with them because it, it challenges me creatively. And I feel like it's just, it's so much easier to do. Like if you see a recipe that has five ingredients, you can be like, oh, well, you know, I have kale in my house or I have this, I can add this stuff. But if I write a recipe that has 14 ingredients, it just seems like a burden to make it. So definitely feel free to put your own spin on these. Um, for that Avgo Lemono soup, I actually love adding greens to the end sometimes. Um, or if you wanted to add chicken, you could do that too. So, so don't be limited by it, but as far as just the core of the recipe, it will taste delicious in my opinion with uh, just these five ingredients. So our, our bison chili, we mentioned, I have one pound of ground bison. So you absolutely can use ground beef. It will be nearly identical. You could use ground turkey if you like, or ground chicken. Um, bison is actually just, a, it's a little bit leaner than beef. Um, and just because of it's, you know, not as, as popular, it's not produced in as big of quantities, it tends to be like less factory farmed um, than ground beef. But um, I think it's, it's taste is really nice. I feel like it's one of those meats or proteins that people tend to really like it. Um, so just thought, hey, this could be something fun to try, but absolutely you could use one of those other two uh, if you prefer. And then if you did want to make this vegetarian or vegan, you can do that as well. I would just use um, a can of black beans. We will be browning the meat, which you will not need to do with beans. So you would just throw those in later, um, but know that you can make any of those substitutions. Um, so we have our bison. I have two cans of diced fire roasted tomatoes. 
So I'll show you what those look like. Brand does not matter. Actually, a bunch of brands make these, but you can see this fire roasted tomato. So there's like some nice char on them. Um, if you just have regular diced tomatoes, great. That will work too. Um, the fire roasted, it just like adds a little bit of a, you know, more of like a long cooked flavor, that char. I actually use them a lot. So typically I don't buy tons of very niche ingredients because they're not as flexible, but this is one that like, when I'm buying things to stock my pantry, they taste really good in a lot of stuff. So just one of my little culinary secrets. I also have uh, two tablespoons of chili powder. So when you're shopping for chili powder, I'll show you again what I'm, I'm working with. And you can use, you know, as much or as little as you like. You're gonna find really two kinds in the grocery store. Um, most likely you only find one, which is the kind we're using. But chili powder, can either be just ground up red chilies. Uh, that's actually what's really common in Indian cuisine. That's my personal background. Um, or you'll find in the grocery store chili powder, which is really a mixture of spices. So there'll be a little ground chili. There might be cumin, there might be coriander, garlic, just all of these different spices, um, maybe oregano. And that's what we're going for tonight. So chances are what you bought is either, you know, chili powder, Mexican chili powder, some sort of blend like that. If you can't really deal with like the heat in, in these type of blends, um, a lot of them actually don't have heat, that like spicy heat. Um, so you can buy them without being super spicy. They might just have paprika in them instead of like a cayenne pepper or some other kind of chili. If you're just kind of working with what's in your pantry tonight and you didn't want to do the heat, you're not sure about the chili powder, a little bit of like cumin and coriander or paprika could be great too. So maybe like a teaspoon of each if you're trying to modify this a little bit. Um, if you don't like the spices at all, honestly, this will still taste pretty good without them. It'll just be much more bland. You could add garlic, like we're gonna have an onion. You could also add garlic if you didn't want any of the spices flavors, but um, I obviously enjoy it. So we're going to work with that tonight. So that was three. Four is just one onion. This is the only thing we have to cut tonight. So very, very easy work. Uh, this will be great. You know, these recipes are really quick to put together. All we have to do is cut one onion. And if you are ever not up, you know, not feeling doing that, most grocery stores now do sell different chopped vegetables, including onions. Um, so you could always just get some chopped onions, sometimes frozen too or use like a food processor if you wanted to pulse it quickly, but I would probably go with the, the store-bought chopped onions if you don't feel like doing that, but it does add great flavor, so I like it. And then the last ingredient for this is our frozen butternut squash. So again, not making you cut up a whole squash. We're just gonna be using two bags like this of just frozen butternut. This is a one pound bag. If yours are slightly different, it doesn't matter. Just a bunch of frozen squash. And this is a great use of frozen vegetables. So uh, anytime you're making a soup and like the texture is softer, it's going to be great for freezing, uh, which I'm actually gonna do later tonight. Well, I'll freeze some extra, but uh, freezing affects the texture of foods because the ice crystals kind of expand and they break the texture. So that's why if you freeze like a broccoli floret, it's gonna be mushy when you defrost it because it's broken that cellulose and that plant structure. Um, so that's kind of a bummer if you wanted to make roast broccoli, but if you wanted to make cream of broccoli soup or you know even just a soup with some broccoli in it, that's great, right? Because soup kind of gets a little mushy anyway. Um, and that's why I'm using the frozen squash, same thing. I don't need that fresh cut squash that's gonna get nice and crispy. I just need, um, you know, that flavor. So love using the frozen squash. So my uh, broth kind of bubbled up. So I, that's my clue to turn the heat down. So just keep an eye on yours. We'll just kind of keep an eye on these as we're going. I'm just gonna give mine a little bit of a stir. And I do actually have another camera where I can show a top down view. So when some exciting stuff starts to happen, we'll look that way. Uh, but in the meantime, I just want little bubbles. So kind of little steady bubbles is what a simmer looks like. So I'm gonna put this back because we don't need it quite yet. And I'm gonna put this stuff to the side. And the first thing we're gonna get working on is our onion. Um, and please let me know, like I said, I'm kind of checking that chat periodically. If you do have a question, type it in or just unmute yourself, happy to pause. So I have my onion 
And the good news about soup is you can kind of cut this however you want. Um, but if you do want to have a little bit of like a mini knife skills lesson, we can go over how I would cut the onion. And um, it's funny because I feel like a lot of chefs we learn like the same standard cutting techniques, usually French, sometimes Japanese in culinary school or in kitchens and everyone has sort of the same way that you're expected to cut things. Onions, I have seen probably like 15 different ways to cut an onion, which I would not have expected. So I, I'm not saying this is the right way. This is just the way that, that I learn and that I see in a lot of kitchens. So I'm gonna start by cutting off each end of the onion, but pretty close. So you have two ends, we'll get a little bit closer um, just to do a little onion anatomy. This is the root end. So when you have like that little hairy um, kind of round end, that is the root. And then you have, you know, I call this the tail. So you have these two, we're just gonna cut them off close, but remember which one is the root. So I kind of use that as a guidepost later. So I'm gonna cut this off, cut the root off, but pretty close to the edge. And then you will see the root is still visible in the onion. So you can see that round area, you know, it doesn't have that little hairy part on it. And I'm going to cut just straight through there. So it's like two semicircles. So this is my guideline for where to cut my onion in half. So cut that in half and then just peel off the paper. So if you have a little garbage bowl nearby, that will be helpful. Like I said, we're not doing, we're not doing too much cutting tonight. And so you can peel off that paper and then, you know, if it, the top layer ends up coming off too, that's fine as well. And then basically we're going to turn this into cubes by making three cuts. So I'm going to find the root end. In this case, it's over here. I'm putting it away from my knife and I am going to cut on this plane, like up, and then I'm gonna make the other two cuts. So basically I'm gonna take half of the onion, put it in front of me. I'm gonna put my hand on top, but with my fingers flexed, so there's no chance of kind of cutting them. And then I'm gonna hinge at the waist, look to see that I'm about a half inch up off the cutting board and using nice long sawing motions, start sawing the onion, but not going all the way through. So you can see how, and I know sometimes, sometimes white ingredients don't, um, show up too well, but you can see my knife is not all the way through there. Maybe that's, yeah, there we go. So you can see it's not all the way through. And I'm gonna pull the knife out, go about half an inch up from that cut and saw, 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 but again, not all the way through. I'm trying to keep the onion intact so that it doesn't fall all over the board. So this onion is kind of small, so I only made two cuts. Max you'll probably make is three cuts. It's not, um, you know, onions don't get that big. So then the next step is I'm gonna take that root end and I'm gonna face it away from me. So I'm going to then do half inch cuts on this plane, but again, not going all the way to the end. So half inch, half inch. I'm kind of curving my fingers over here too, just so I don't accidentally nick my finger. And so now I have my little half inch cuts. And then lastly, I'm gonna flip that root end back to the uh, other side so it's away from my knife. And then finally, I'm going to make um, my last cut, sort of finishing off the cube. And so I actually do have um, another camera here. So maybe Andy, we can switch to the overhead camera, but I'll just kind of point out some of those things might be a little bit easier to see. So just to go over my first cut, there's that camera. Oh, here we go. Okay. My first cut was, you know, this way. Then my next cut, there we go, was this way. So I cut here half inch, half inch, half inch. And then my last cut, I'm turning it back this way. And this will be kind of tricky to do with, you know, one hand. Um, so I'll wait, but I'm going to cut like this. And so I'm going to put this down. We'll switch back to the main view and finish cutting our onion. But like I said, however you wanna cut your onion, it's soup, it's gonna be fine. We just want that delicious onion flavor and we wanna kind of sweat it out and get that good flavor. So no stress if that was 
that's a little too complicated. I actually do teach a whole knife skills class, um, both virtually and then when, when we have classes in person, also teach it in person. And for people who love to cook, I feel like it's just such a great class because no matter what you like to make, it is practical. And really, no matter your skill level, even for me, I can get a lot out of a knife skills class, just having that practice and, you know, having someone help me kind of one on one. So definitely a class if you or someone you know, likes to cook, kind of a safe bet that they would enjoy a knife skills class. So just finishing up this onion. Like I said, that's the, the only cutting we are doing tonight. So let's go ahead. I am going to heat up my second pot. And we are going to start to saute this onion a little bit. So the rule, anytime we cook with, where I'm using stainless steel cookware tonight or cast iron, pretty much most cookware, is that you want to heat the pot, then add oil, then add your food. So if you, you know, add food to a pot that's like not heated up, chances are it's going to stick um, or it's just going to absorb a lot of oil. Um, so that's why we like to do that in that order. Uh, the one exception might be nonstick cookware. Sometimes depending on what they're coated with, you kind of have to follow the instructions that that particular cookware comes with. But often you're not supposed to let those get too hot. Um, so you might not do that full on preheating step. But for you know traditional cookware like stainless steel, um, you want to heat it up, add your oil, then add your food. So that's why we're kind of hanging out for a second while this heats up. And then I will just be using a little drizzle of olive oil, but whatever cooking oil you like to use. And then, oh, bye Lise, thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to transfer the onion to this pot here. And this is just a little tool that I have. You, you don't, it's not, you know, necessary. This is called a bench scraper. And so these are great. I actually use them a lot in the knife skills class because they have like a ruler on one side. I'll use them for cutting dough and shaping dough. A really great multi-purpose kitchen tool. This is actually a KitchenAid one. Um, and so this is great for like scooping up ingredients and transferring them to a pot. Much better, much safer than using your knife and it can kind of hold a lot more. Um, they're called bench scrapers too, because they're actually good for like cleaning your, your bench or your counter, like if you had dough on it. Um, so just kind of a, a nice tool if you're doing a lot of chopping. So you probably can't hear through my headphones, but you want that nice sizzle when you add your onions or really any vegetable that's letting me know my pot is hot enough. And then I'm just doing a little sprinkle of salt. Salt is gonna help draw out the moisture from the onions going to kind of help get them going in terms of cooking. Um, and it obviously adds flavor too. We don't want to wait to add all the salt for the recipe till the very end. Because, uh, you know, it, it, depending on what you're cooking, it may not mix in well, you know, you, you won't really get those layers of flavor. So just a little salt along the way is just the kind of the best way to go. So I will let this kind of continue to sweat. Typically for soup, we want to sweat onions, which means that they get kind of juicy, they release their moisture, they turn translucent, but they don't brown. And while like brown or caramelized onions or crispy onions are delicious, we usually don't use them for soup because you don't actually want those little crispy bits kind of breaking off into your soup. Um, it's just really not necessary and it might be kind of annoying too. So we really just want that flavor to develop. So that's why I'm not adding the rest of the ingredients uh, right now. I, especially with recipes that just have a few ingredients, you really want to make sure that you're developing flavor. So we're going to let this go maybe two or three more minutes. Um, then we'll be adding our spices and then we'll be adding our bison. Um, our tomatoes and our squash, it all kind of comes together pretty quickly. So this is an easy one. It does need to cook for a little bit to get that squash to defrost, um, but kind of one where you just kind of add everything, let it cook and it'll be great. Oh, my other pot is boiling. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I saw, I saw those bubbles come up. Why don't we all grab my other camera and you can take a look at what's going on here. This is a nice hot burner. So I will just switch over here and then Andy, when you're ready, you can um, flip over to this. Okay, 
So this is what's going on in my avolemino pot. So I'll kind of show you a little bit here. So you can see this rice, still very intact, still not fully cooked. I took off the lid so the heat kind of came down, but really we want um, a little bit more simmer action going here, but you can see all those bubbles kind of popping. This is great. And then that lid, you know, makes the heat go up a little bit more. My second pot has the onions in it. You can probably see that sizzle happening. They're still a little too crunchy, a little too white. You know, they're not translucent yet. So these definitely need a little bit more time to develop their flavor. But we'll just kind of keep an eye on these. Um, so I'll set this down and we can switch back to the main view. And actually, while we're waiting for this to come up um, to kind of saute a little bit, let me put this lid back on. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about kind of storing and freezing soup, because I do feel like that's one of the perks of making soup is that it's delicious that night but it's great later in the week. It's great if you freeze it and defrost it. So I wanna give you some like best practices for using soup that way. So let me show you a couple uh, things. So I will grab some containers I have in the freezer. So for storing food, I personally, I actually do usually use glass containers for my refrigerator. I like that they're clear and I can see through, they're reusable, you know, that you're not gonna have any transfer. I personally don't like eat, uh, eating out of plastic either. Um, but for the freezer, obviously glass can be a little bit riskier. So personally, if I am making soup, I actually usually do freeze it in plastic. It is possible to do in glass. You'll just need to be a little bit more careful. You can use all kinds of containers, but my go-tos are really these like deli style containers. Um, this is a pint size container and this is a quart size container. And the reason I like them is because for most people, this pint is actually a perfect one serving. So if you make like a giant pot of soup that's 12 servings, you know, you might not want to defrost that whole thing. You might want to, you know, defrost one type of soup one night and maybe a different type the next week. So pints I think are great for single servings. And then if you want to do two servings, the quart is great too. I also pretty low tech, but we'll just use um, some masking tape on the top to label the type of the soup and then date it as well. So this kind of helps you know how long things, you know, have been in your freezer. Typically the recommendation for, for frozen foods in general is about six months in your freezer. Uh, so that could be a good guideline depending on what you're making, you know, that may vary as well. Um, if you have a refrigerator and freezer like the one I have behind me, this is called a French store style refrigerator where you have like the two big doors um, and then the bin for your frozen items. That is actually why I put the labels on top so that you can open it up and you don't have to be like sorting through things. I tend to put all of my whole ingredients like vegetables and, you know, frozen fruits for smoothies, spinach, things like that on one side. And then on the other side, I have all of like my made homemade food that's labeled. So it's just a little bit easier to find. Um, and then for freezing it, you want to, you know, cook it, let it cool, but put it in your containers and then refrigerate it first. Let it cool down completely there and then transfer it to the freezer. If you try to transfer directly to the freezer, one, you just don't want to put hot things in your freezer because it'll partially defrost your other food, which is not good. Um, but also you'll trap extra steam in there and that's how you'll get those ice crystals. So, you know, look, two-step process, but still pretty easy, you know, put in your refrigerator and then later that night or the next day, whatever you want, transfer it to the freezer to let it freeze. And then on the flip side for defrosting, best practice is to take your soup from the freezer put it in the refrigerator that's sort of the safest easiest way to defrost food is over the course of a day or even more in the refrigerator um, in a pinch though and the other reason i like these containers is sometimes what i will do is if you know i haven't planned and you know but we have food or i'm really hungry whatever i will just put this whole frozen block of soup in the container under the faucet, let some hot water run on it, just so it defrosts like enough that it pops out. So then I'll pop it out directly into a pot and then boil it on the cooktop that way. So that's, it's, you know, 
a little less elegant, right? Because you kind of have this like ice block that you're chipping at, but I mean, you can really reheat soup very quickly that way. Um, so that's my like in case of emergency method, uh, but definitely the one I recommend is just transfer to the refrigerator a little bit easier, a little bit safer too, in terms of like food safety that you don't have food. The last thing you want to do is leave it out on the counter. So don't do that. Um, but you could do one of the other two methods. Um, I'm just going to put these to the side and I will transfer my soup to them later when it's done. But let's take another look at these onions. These are looking good. Let me show you. Maybe we'll go up close to the camera this way so you can see. But you can see my onions are definitely like, but you can see how this is like a little bit translucent, see-through, it's softer. That's what we're going for. So no harm in cooking it a little bit longer, um, but let it at least get to that point. Okay, and then next we will add our spices. So let's talk, we talked a little bit about some options for spices. If you are, you know, coming up with your own soup recipe, that's kind of the fun thing about soup too, is you can use it to clear out things in the fridge, or if you, you know, go to the farmer's market or the grocery store, see something that looks interesting, you can often turn it into a soup. So there are, is like a certain order that you want to add ingredients to get the most out of them. So I just want to share that with you briefly. So we already talked, you know, oil first um, or butter, you know, whatever kind of cooking fat you're working with. And then we talked about onions. At this first stage is when you want to add any aromatic ingredients. So we use that term aromatic in the culinary space to describe foods like onions that we use for their, their flavor or their aroma, right? This is not an onion chili or an onion soup. We're just using the onion for flavor. So onions would go here, leeks, shallots, garlic, ginger, lemongrass, you know, sort of anything like that. It's great to cook in the oil first because that's really how you develop um, the flavors of those aromatics. If I were to add, you know, a chopped onion in at the end of cooking my soup, wouldn't really give off flavor, right? I would just kind of have chunks of raw onion in my soup. Not good. Um, next, you want to add any dry spices. So um, spices also need that contact with the heat and the oil to really release their flavors. If you add them, if you add powder spices directly to oil, they'll just burn up like that. So it's great to have this little bed of onions or garlic or whatever you're working with to kind of just act as a little protective bed. Um, so I'm going to sprinkle my spices in and I am using the whole two tablespoons of chili powder. This is not uh, spicy chili powder. It just has all those different, you know, talks about like paprika um, and, and cumin and coriander and sort of different spices like that. And I'm just stirring it in. Gonna mix this for about 30 seconds to get that interaction with the heat, but you should get that smell pretty immediately and that smell should develop. But same thing as the onion you really won't get the flavor out of your spices if you add them later in your cooking when you have all your broth or your liquid going. Okay, so then next we are going to add our bison or our beef or ground turkey and um, let it brown. And I'm actually, I'm gonna keep the onions in there. It'll be kind of nice to mix all that in there. So I'm just gonna pop on some gloves. You obviously do not need to do this at home. Um, but I tend to, when I teach, use gloves um, just to kind of keep everything nice and clean, but also uh, just to spare you of having to watch me wash my hands uh, so many times throughout the class. So that's why I have a little bowl here to kind of keep all those raw um, juices in there too. So I'm just going to use some kitchen shears, open up this package. Like I said, this is one pound but you could always do you know, more or less depending on what you like. And then I do like to break it up a little bit as it goes in. It just kind of makes a little less work for me to do with the wooden spoon. Yeah, bison is typically very lean. Um, so I actually, the, maybe the one complaint people might have about it is that it, it can be very lean and so it can dry out. Um, so often people do cook it more like rare or medium, like even if they're making burgers or something, obviously with like a chili or a soup or something with ground meat, we're, we're not gonna do that. We are gonna fully cook it, 
but that is why it's great to have it combined with um, these great veggies. It, it's just gonna provide that juiciness and you're not really gonna notice, oh, if this is dry or not. It's just, it's not really gonna be a factor. So I'm gonna take that same spoon and just start breaking up the meat in here. And then let's just do one more. We'll go overhead again, just so you can see what's going on in here. Um, so Andy, whenever you're ready. Awesome. So you can see my onions with those spices. It kind of makes like a nice little blend. And then I'm just taking my spoon, breaking up the bison. And I am actually going to kind of fully cook it here just to make sure that it's broken up, just to make sure because this cooks so quickly that everything is fully cooked or at least very, very close. So then I know the last few minutes of, of simmering, it will be fully cooked, but we're just gonna kind of break this up. And then if you're curious what's going on my other pot, I'm getting a lot of bubbles here, just that extra starch, but this is just simmering away. And let me show you what the rice is looking like too. So rice, you can see is getting definitely a lot more cooked but it can wait for me. So that's what I like about it. This is probably ready to go, but I, I actually like to cook it a little bit more. You can see that rice is, is getting fully cooked, which is great. Um, so we can switch back to the main view. Awesome. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this back on and then we will get out that, um, those tomatoes and that frozen squash as well. So I'm doing the two cans of the diced fire roasted tomatoes. So all we need to do is just open these and pop them in as soon as that bison is cooked. So I'll get those ready, get out your can openers. And if you, like I mentioned, if you just had regular diced tomatoes or even whole peeled tomatoes, just chop them up. That would be great too. Those are usually, if I'm kind of stocking my pantry, I don't know what I'm gonna make. I almost will always get the whole peeled canned tomatoes because you can turn those into pretty much whatever you want. If you wanted pureed tomatoes or diced tomatoes, you know, you can make them. If you wanted tomato sauce, you know, you have the ingredient. Whereas if you get, you know, something very particular, it's hard to go the other way. But like I said, I do like the flavor of the fire roasted tomatoes. So I tend to buy those too, because I think they just add a lot. All right. So these two cans are open. I'm just gonna break this up a little bit more and we will get our squash as well. And then don't forget to add a little salt at this step as well. Especially with our meat, we wanna make sure that's seasoned. So just, you know, maybe two nice big pinches. And I will say this recipe too, we're not gonna be adding any broth or really anything that does have salt in it, depending on your, you know, your tomatoes might have a little bit, but usually they're not crazy salty. Um, so you will want to season this one um, more where sometimes when you're adding like box stock, it may already have a bunch of salt in it. And then that's where you might wanna go a little bit easier. Okay. All right, so get the squash as well. Definitely you could cut your own squash. Uh, you could use butternut, which is what we're using tonight. Honey nut, you know, kaboka squash, really anything. I mean, there's so much in season now, so it would be great, but it is, it is just a lot of um, work to do. So I like to do that work when there's gonna be the payoff. So when you have that roasted squash or that stuffed squash, it really makes a difference. I just don't think it makes a difference in a soup. So I um, think it's totally fine to use that uh, frozen squash, they're usually, grow, you know, frozen when they're in season. Um, so usually the flavor is pretty good. Um, if you're curious what kinds of uh, frozen vegetables I buy, I mean, I do love eating fresh food. You know, I mentioned healthy food. Um, so I do definitely, I always have frozen squash. I do like frozen greens as well. Um, so like spinach and kale, I uh, usually have those. I like frozen edamame, but often I'll get it outside of the pods. So if I just wanna do like a quick, you know, stir fry or just, you know, have a little snack, it's something I can just kind of add into something and, and get some protein. Um, and then I do like frozen riced cauliflower as well. I feel like that, 
that quality is pretty good too because it's something you want to heat you want to cook I, I often will make my own too you know run it through the food processor but those are just some of the frozen food staples that I have I tend really not to have that many like you know fro frozen food products like sort of finished dishes because I find with just like the frozen veggies or frozen rice or something I can kind of make my own so this, I can tell there's just a tiny bit of pink left in, you know, some of the meat, but that is fine. It is like, I would say 95% cooked through. And so I'm going to add those two cans, just pour them right in. And then I'm also going to add the squash. So just tearing open the bags, putting them in. And, and no need to defrost these. It's fine to just go straight from frozen. Yeah, squash is just the winter squashes like this or fall squashes. One of my favorite foods because they're like naturally sweet, they're soft, they're kind of easy to digest, you know, full of, you know, beta carotene, different nutrients, fiber, like healthy carbs. So especially if you don't have, you know, maybe an appetite for eating a lot of different things. Squash is like a, is a really nice food to have around because it is, it's just like, you know, it's easy on the stomach. It's nutritious, um, you know, not, not too much fiber, not too little fiber. So I think it's just a great food to kind of know a couple different ways to work with it. Uh, another thing I do with frozen squash, which if you um, head to my website, it's just my name. So aliadalal.com, but there is um, a recipe there for butternut squash note meal so it's like no oatmeal basically you use like frozen butternut squash to kind of make like a an oatmeal style dish but instead of oats you use squash so i think it's great for um yeah maybe days when you you know your stomach isn't up to too much or maybe if you eat carbs in the morning you get tired or you know whatever it is but i think it's delicious this time of year so that could be another idea of something to do uh, with some frozen squash so this is my part is done, right? It still needs to cook because we have frozen squash in there. So let's do a little bit of some salt too. And then, ooh, lid or no lid, that is the question. Honestly, this could probably go either way. Let me actually show you what it looks like now. Um, so we'll go overhead again. It almost, on camera, it almost looks like it's done, but it is not. That squash is still very much frozen. You'll see there's not a lot of liquid. So, you know, I mentioned this was a chili or more of a stew. So that's fine that there's not a lot. It might look a little dry, but what you have to remember is actually vegetables are mostly water. So your instinct may be to add water to this, but actually as this cooks, it's gonna create its own water. So I'm gonna put the lid on to kind of encourage that and keep the heat in, but this is, you know, what we, this is what we want. So I'm just gonna put that lid on let that come up to a heat and then we will look at our other soup which should kind of look basically how it did before so you can see we have that nice soft rice this is looking great so let's take a minute and just get set up for our second recipe so andy i'll have you go back to the main view sorry try not to move around too much with that other camera i don't want to make anyone dizzy um, but I know I'm, I'm making Andy be like a feature film director tonight with changing all the shots. I just, you know, with virtual, I want to make sure that you can see everything. Um, and sometimes it's actually nice. Sometimes you can see better than you can in person. Um, so, but if, if there is something you want to see or see again, just let me know and we, and we can go back. So let's get the other ingredients for our Abgo Lemono soup and finish that one. So just a recap. Our first two ingredients were our rice and our broth. So it is, you know, those are the two, nothing special. We just brought them up to a simmer and basically just like cooked them. Our next three ingredients are lemons, uh, the lemono part. Um, so I have two lemons, but it's subjective, you know, depending on how lemony you like it. I also have four eggs. So these are large eggs. This is what's gonna create our creaminess. It's gonna add some protein to the recipe. It's gonna be great. And then our fifth ingredient is some fresh dill. So this is like a really pantry friendly recipe. 
I think the dill, or like I mentioned, sometimes I do spinach or kale, like it's nice to have that green element, especially if you're, you know, maybe eating the same thing a few days in a row, it just brings some life back into it, makes it taste fresh. So if I am making something ahead, I always try to add the green element, like right when I'm about to eat it. So the, the dill is just going to be for garnish, but dill, I feel like it's such an underutilized spice um, or herb. It really is, is going to add some flavor to this. But again, if you, if you want to choose something else or you don't like dill, that's fine. You could use some dried dill, but usually dried herbs just don't really stand up to their, their fresh counterparts. So typically I, I don't use them, um, except in like certain scenarios, like with Persian cuisine, there's tons of dried herbs and you use them in a very specific way. So I use dried dill for that. I probably wouldn't with this soup, but it's up to you. So got our dill. So this is kind of the, the trickiest, but not trickiest part of tonight's class. And I love teaching little techniques like this in class because I feel like it's one of those things, if you just read it in a recipe where it's like, okay, now, now temper the eggs and whisk them and put them back in and bring it up to temperature, you'd be like, eh, I don't know. Like this, this sounds complicated. I don't know what she's talking about. But when you watch me do it or when you do it with me, you're like, oh, that, that's easy. Now I understand what those words mean. So that's basically what we're gonna do tonight. So I'm gonna get my four eggs, one of my lemons, and then I'm gonna get a, a pretty big bowl. So a big or a medium sized bowl. So I'm just gonna use this glass bowl here. So I'm gonna start off by just cutting my lemon in half and I wanna squeeze all the juice into the bowl. So I'm gonna use one of these little lemon squeezers. I love lemon and citrus. So I use it probably every day. So I love, this is a, another little KitchenAid tool, just a little lemon squeezer. Great for getting all of the juice out of your lemons, um, especially if you're buying like organic lemons or, you know, they can get kind of pricey. So you want to make sure you get all that juice out of them. So a uh, little tip I kind of skipped over. If you are using a tool like this, put your lemon cut side down. Uh, just a mistake I see people making. They want to put it cut side up, but cut side down actually helps you get all the juice out of it because it kind of turns the little lemon half. Like you can see it's almost turned like inside out. It's like very, very compressed. So that is our one lemon. And then now crack your four eggs into the same bowl. Now when cracking eggs, never crack them on the side of the bowl. Crack them on the counter or a flat surface and then break them into your bowl. Basically, if you do it on the side of the bowl, it's just less even, it's a weird angle. You're much more likely to get shell in your bowl. So just crack them straight down, then break them open. And four is perfect for this recipe. So we just have the two things in this bowl, the lemon juice and the eggs. I'm gonna get this out of the way. Wipe off my hands a little bit. Okay. I'm gonna just shuffle a few things around. I told you, I just leave stuff everywhere. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep each other organized tonight. Okay, so I have my dill over here, which is great. And I still want my lemon. So let me move this stuff to the side. The second lemon is just going to be um, for serving. So people like different lemon levels. Sometimes it's nice, again, especially if it's like a recipe that's, you know, been sitting in your fridge for a day. Nice to do like a nice fresh squeeze of lemon. So if you want to cut this one now while your board is out, just go ahead and cut it into a couple wedges. And if you are making this for someone else and you want to, you know, really treat them well, you can, you can be like me, you can be like a professional chef. We always take the time to fish out the little seeds. Uh, for people, mostly because we don't want anyone choking on a lemon seed or, a, you know, pit or something and blaming us. Um, but it is just a nice little touch too. So notice that next time you go to a restaurant, it's like a, a mark of a, a sort of nicer restaurant that someone will fish out those little um, uh, lemon seeds for you. So these will be good. Okay, so our lemon will be ready for garnish. And then I have my bowl and I'm just gonna use like a regular whisk. So if you don't have a whisk, you could get away with a fork. A whisk is just a little bit easier. So I just poke the yolks just to break them up a little bit. And I'm trying just to make like a, just like a smooth mixture. Like if I was gonna make, you know, scrambled eggs or 
um, you know, custard or just something where I was like whisking up eggs. It's just gonna be a little bit thinner because of that lemon juice. And then this is where we're going to do that step called tempering. So basically your brain, if, if you haven't heard of this before, your brain has probably already identified the challenge here, which is how am I gonna add eggs to hot soup and not end up with, you know, egg drop soup with scrambled eggs, something like that. And so the step we use is actually called tempering. So I'm going to take this hot broth and I'm slowly gonna add it to the bowl. And so it's very gradually gonna bring up the temperature of the eggs until they are hot. So if I go, you know, cold eggs, hot soup, scrambled eggs. But if I do it slowly, the eggs are tempered and then they, they come up to the safe temperature to eat, but they did so, so gradually that they stay like in that sort of emulsified state. So you use this actually for making custards. Uh, if you've ever made ice cream, it's really the same step. Um, and it's just applied to a soup in this technique, in this instance. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. I missed a couple questions. Um, Maribeth's asking instant rice work instead of boiling it for so long. Yes. So the other thing you could do is also, if you had like leftover rice, again, white rice. Um, so instant rice would work is yeah, you could add it. I would still cook it in there a little bit. You know, you want to get it up to heat, um, and you know, break down a little bit too. So, but yes, I would say instant rice, leftover rice. That would be great. Um, oh, and honey, the biscuits are good. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> I know, surprisingly, I'll chat a little bit about those, but there, it's, it's not too much effort. So, um, okay. So I have a ladle and I have my bowl over here. So I'm actually going to switch my pots around again, just so you guys get that good view. So I'll put my chili on that hottest burner and I'll actually just turn the heat off my other ones. But now I have a little station here. Always make, you know, your kitchen work for you. I can't tell you how many times I do it too, right? Where you're like something over here and you're like running over to the trash, you know, bring a garbage bowl, move the trash, move your body, make it easier on yourself. So I'm going to take just the broth. The rice is going to kind of sink to the bottom. It's fine if you get some rice, but just mostly broth. And I'm going to whisk it in while I add it. So actually I like to have my whisk in my dominant hand, which for me is my right hand. And then I put the ladle in the other hand. So I just kind of slowly pour this in and whisk it. So I'm just gonna keep going for a few ladle bowls. So it kind of depends on how big your ladle is and then like how, how risky you wanna be. Usually I add like a ton of liquid um, because I don't want those eggs to scramble. So I kind of probably go overboard a little bit. So this is now my third ladle and just stream it in and whisk. If you have a second person in your kitchen, that would work too. One person streams, one person whisks. And maybe I'll do another one too. And again, at a certain point, you will start getting some rice in there. That's fine. It just, you know, can get caught in your whisk if you add a ton of it. So just kind of streaming this in and you'll see, you know, your, your bowl starts to feel warm. So I know I'm getting somewhere. If you're, you know, depending on the size of your pot, you can kind of tilt it a little bit. And those first few ladles are kind of where, you know, the danger happens. So if you, if you made it through that, it's fine. And you know what, you may end up, if you heat it up a little too much, like once it's back in the pot, you may end up with like tiny, tiny little flecks of what's technically a scrambled egg. And you know what, it's soup, it has rice in it, that's fine. This is actually a great time to practice this technique. If you were making, you know, a pastry at a Michelin star restaurant, okay, yes, that would be a problem. But if you get a teeny bit of the egg cooked out in there, that's fine. Especially if, you know, I know, um, you know, some people might be concerned and wanting to make sure their, their soup is the proper temperature. So I would say, you know, to totally fine to err on the side of caution and just heat it up a little bit extra if you want. And so this is really this traditional method of making this soup. Sometimes you'll see it made with like just egg yolks or more egg yolks. I use the, um, uh, the whole egg really just for economics. Um, egg yolk will be a little bit easier to not overcook because the, the whites, as you know, set at a lower temperature, right? That's how you get the set whites and the um, runny yolks when you make like a fried egg. 
Um, but a lot of times restaurants now will use, you know, maybe they'll use some eggs, but they'll use like cornstarch or flour. They'll do other things um, to kind of thicken it, but you just don't get that nice, like velvety, great texture. So you can see I've added a decent amount of liquid. And my bowl is like, it's like a um, hot bowl of soup. So I'm going to show you closer to the camera what this looks like. And then I'm just going to add it into the big pot. And please let me know if there's any questions on this step. Um, so you can see, I now have this nice creamy broth. It's still thin, you know, it's not like a puree, but it's like so velvety and um, sort of evenly creamy. But yeah, not like a, you know, pureed soup. So really unique. And if there is like a soup you like, and you really like this, you know, flavor, like maybe the, you know, we talked about like the chicken noodle soup or, you know, other vegetables, you could definitely apply this technique um, as long as you do this tempering step to soups, you know, that maybe you just want to make a little bit creamier. So I mean, I'm going to set this bowl to the side. And I typically do like to just barely heat this up again, just especially, you know, I've been chatting, maybe my soup has cooled down a little bit, but absolutely just keep whisking it. Otherwise you will, you know, start to get that egg to cook out, but don't bring it back up to a boil. A boil is 212 degrees, remember, and that is, you know, a lot hotter than our eggs need to be to cook. So, um, but just, you know, I like to, you know, make sure that it's, it's hot enough again. And then this soup is done. So like I mentioned, all we'll do is just cut a little dill put that on top, we'll have our lemon wedges and you have this delicious, you know, creamy soup. You could add that, you know, spinach or kale or if you had like a rotisserie chicken or, or if you wanted to cook chicken in this, if you had um, like some raw chicken breasts, I would add them when you add the rice. So you could actually kind of cook a chicken breast along with this. I would actually, a lot of instances, I wouldn't do chicken breast over thigh. You could do either, but um, you know, the thighs have a lot, you know, more fat in them, which is fine, but it'll just cook out into your soup and it'll kind of, you know, maybe collect on the top or kind of affect the, the texture. So if you did want to cook raw chicken, do it with the broth and the rice stage. Okay. <laughs> Mary Beth, not trying to cheat. Um, this is a five ingredient soup class. Like this is a cheater's class. So sometimes that's what we want in the kitchen. <laughs> Um, and I think sometimes that surprises people too, because they think, oh, professional chefs, they must spend, you know, so much time cooking every meal. And it's like, you know, a lot of people, especially restaurant chefs, um, you know, they spend their whole day cooking. So we actually love sort of hacks that allow you to get great flavor and use quality ingredients, but don't take unnecessary time. So I really love sharing that with people because I think everyone can really benefit from that. Um, so our avo lemon soup is done. My chili is simmering away here. So I believe that it is done too. The last thing I want to do is just season both of these. So this I know is a little tricky. Honestly, it's tricky in person classes too, because I'm not going to have everyone, you know, stick their, their hand and their, their spoon in this pot. But let's talk through seasoning, because that is uh, kind of like the knife skill. It's just a great skill to have and a reason you might be like, Oh, you know that soup sounded really good but it didn't it didn't taste that good and i don't know why like i think i bet hers tasted good and the key is seasoning so let's taste the avgo lemono first so the first thing you want to do is just you know take a spoonful taste it and in my head i am asking myself does this taste like anything like does this taste and then specifically, does it taste like the ingredients I added? So if I was like, wait, you know, like that chicken broth is good and the eggs and that lemon. And if I'm like, I really can't taste anything. It tastes like nothing. That is my clue to add some salt. So salt allows us to taste all of the flavors in food. I don't necessarily want everything to be very salty, but I just need enough salt to kind of unlock the lemon or the chili powder or the onion. Um, so that's kind of my clue. So if I, if this actually tastes pretty good, I might add just a teeny bit more salt and give that a little whiff. And then I'm going to take um, a spoon again and taste it. 
and this is the thing. I mean, this took me culinary school to, I had to go to culinary school to learn to taste my food before I like served it to somebody. <laughs> so you guys may be ahead of the game in that. But I would always just like sit down at the table. I'd be like, oh, too bad. This is bad. Like not, not really realizing that I could do anything to change it. So that's what I'm tasting for there. Soup is actually a great way to practice that because there's usually not so many different competing elements and textures. Um, so your brain can kind of focus on, hey, does this need more salt or not? And then, like I said, if you did want more of that brightness and that lemony flavor, you know, I got you covered with the lemon wedges. So then next, let's go to our chili. And same thing, I am just going to, I really wanna make sure that squash is cooked. So I'm kind of cutting into it with the side of my spoon. Gonna take a little spoonful that has a little bit of everything. And again, like this one has spices in it, it has onions. So if this doesn't taste like anything, I know I need some salt. So it tastes pretty good, but it is just a little bland. So I am going to add some salt. And like I said, you know, we have two pounds of frozen squash in there. That's a lot of, um, you know, really water and kind of blander flavors. So I definitely want to add a little bit of salt there. Um, and then other things you can add, um, especially if, you know, your tastes are, are maybe not what they always are. Um, you know, salt is a good one. Lemon is something you can always have in your arsenal too, to kind of make things taste a little bit better. Um, and then this one might sound unusual, but if you're experiencing like bitter flavors, um, sometimes this is like a side effect of different treatments or just, you know, say we did add a bunch of kale and you're not used to eating kale and you're like, Ooh, this is really bitter. Adding something sweet can help counteract that bitterness. So actually our squash in a chili is like a great way to do that. We naturally have some sweetness, but if you, if you feel like it's still maybe a little too bitter, a tiny pinch of like, you know, honey or maple syrup, it sounds weird, but just a little bit of it can really help counteract that bitterness. I think bitterness and sweetness really work in opposition to each other. Um, so that can be a great way to kind of counteract that flavor if it's a little bit too strong. Um, but let me get, um, let, oh, quick question. Do I use coarse salt? So I use um, typically like a kosher salt or like a kosher size salt. So I know it's on camera, I probably won't, you know, you kind of need to, to touch it yourself, but you can see this. It's not like a fine Morton salt. It's like a little shaggy, but it's not like a huge coarse salt. So a lot of chefs like this size, cause you can I see, I can pick it up and it's not falling everywhere. And I can kind of um, sprinkle it evenly. So I would say more of like a kosher size salt. I like to have it in a little dish because over time you'll get good at that seasoning and you'll kind of know how much you're pinching. If you change your salt, if you use a grinder, you'll just never have any way of knowing. It'll take you forever. So find a salt you like. Typically, I will use like a, a kosher salt um, or like a Himalayan sea salt, but that's also like a kosher size. Um, and those are kind of my two go-tos, but it, it's really your personal preference. I just wouldn't use that really finely ground, like a table salt, because um, it's just a little, it's too hard to grab. There's some additives in it. It's just... Um, not typically a go-to, something a little bit bigger is just gonna be better to grab. Um, let's look at our chili too. So I'm gonna grab that camera just so you can see the final version for anyone who's, who's not currently making this. So this is what we're going for. Remember how I said we were gonna get some liquid? I didn't add any liquid. That is just really from that squash too, but you can see it's just such a good flavor. You have the meatiness, from the meat, you have some sweetness from the squash and onions, but then you have that like acidity from the tomatoes and some spiciness too. So with only five ingredients, we really built a lot of interesting flavor. And then I will just see, you can see my rice kind of sinks to the bottom a little bit, but this is my creamy, creamy Avgo Lemono soup. So you can see this one is just like nice and cozy. This is such a nice fall recipe, really pantry friendly. Um, and we'll just top that one with a little bit of dill. Um, so we can go back to the main view. Okay. And then I know we just have a, a few minutes, so I don't want to keep anyone on this call too long, but I did just want to go over that uh, uh, instant dinner biscuit recipe. So I actually, I do have it out here um, and just wanted to explain a, a little bit about it. But basically 
This is a five ingredient, like dinner roll, dinner biscuit recipe, but you don't have to let it rise or wait. And then typically biscuits, you know, you have to cut and fold and stack and they're, they're not hard, but it can be like a little bit of time. So this recipe, it's just flour, kosher salt, a little bit of mayo, milk, and baking powder. And you just mix those all together. And then you are actually going to take a muffin pan. So this is, you know, a 12 muffin pan. This only makes four biscuits. So if you wanted more, you could just multiply the recipe. Take some spray oil, spray four of the um, muffin wells. You'll put the mixture in it. It bakes in like 15 minutes. So if you were making one of these, you know, during the, the simmer time, you can just make your little biscuits. They're really good. I mean, you probably won't win any baking awards with them, but I know my team here loves them. It's just something that's surprisingly good for how easy it is. So I, I love bread. Um, so anytime you can sneak in a little, you know, homemade bread or a little extra carb into the meal, um, I know I'm happy about it. Um, so I would love to, to see if there are any questions happy to answer them. Um, just kind of checking in on you guys and like, you know, any questions on the recipe? Who's making them? How are they turning out? Um, I'll just pause a little bit. And if anyone has anything to share, just feel free to come off mute. Uh, well, thank you all so much. Uh, for joining me tonight, for joining us here at the World of Whirlpool. I definitely hope this is not the last time um, that we get to cook together. Um, we will actually be sending you um, uh, an email. It's just a, a quick survey, optional survey, uh, but we have a very small team here. So I, I know I would love your feedback. I would love to see if there's, you know, classes you would like to see, if you'd like us to, you know, to come back um, and, and do something with, you um, Gilda's Club. So I would love, you know, your feedback on that. If you're able to fill out that survey, it's also how I'm evaluated. So love, you know, if you had a great time and you want to put some good karma out there, um, that's a great way to do that. If you made the recipes and you, you know, took photos, feel free to tag me um, or share them with me on Instagram at Alia Dalal or at World of Whirlpool. We would love to see them. Um, let me just check the chat for um, any questions or comments. Oh, well, well, thank you very Beth. It was, it was lovely um, teaching you and interacting with you as well. Um, awesome, yeah, uh, great, uh, great, Juanita, that you'll try the chili, trying the recipes, hope you come back. Oh, thank you, we ate too fast to take pictures, I love it. That is the mark, in, in our Instagram age, that is the mark of a good recipe, is it not when you don't even have time to take a photo of it? So I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Cher. I'm glad you enjoyed it too. So yes, please keep in touch with us. Um, you can follow us on, if you use Instagram or Facebook, you can follow us there. Um, if you did provide your email as part of registration, you will hear about our public classes as well. So I'll just, I'll take a minute to tell you a little bit about those. So we, I mentioned are this experience center in downtown Chicago, we are open. To the public so if you you know want to visit us check out some appliances anything like that you can do so during the week um, during the day we are open and then we do typically we offer in-person classes we are not doing so right now but we will be in, in the near future so if you do want to do an in-person class it, you can join us and then we do virtual classes every week so check out our website worldofworldpool.com um one of we actually it's really important to us to provide um, some like affordable and approachable classes. So our classes actually start at, at $10. Um, we do have gift cards too. So if you're thinking of like gifts or something to do with friends, maybe someone who's not a part of the Gilda's Club community, but who might enjoy something like this, you know, check out our website. I try to, to come up with, you know, all different kinds of things for all different kinds of people. So would love to see you again. Um, and then hopefully, you know, through Gilda's Club as well too. So thank you so much. I know your food's hot and for those of you that made it. So I want to send you off and enjoy. I know me and my team will be enjoying this here tonight, um, but I will just turn it over um, to Andy if you have any um, other closing words and thank you all so much. All right, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We really hope you enjoyed it. We hope to see you again. Uh, look for that recording uh, so you can repeat this class whenever you like. So thank you all very much.
Have a wonderful evening and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.